You probably know that our modern understanding of evolution comes from the work of Charles Darwin. But what you may not know is that Charles Darwin didn't discover the theory of evolution. Philosophers as far back as the ancient Greeks had understood that species change over time. Charles Darwin's own grandfather, Erasmus Darwin, also expressed evolutionary ideas. These ideas, as well as many other things, influenced Charles Darwin during his discovery and thoughts about the Darwinistic evolutionary process that we know today. In this video, I'm going to talk about these ideas, as well as Charles Darwin's journey on the HMS Beagle and other ideas that influenced Charles Darwin in his establishment of modern evolutionary theory. So stay tuned. Hi, and thanks for tuning in. Today, we're going to be talking about how Darwin's concept of evolution came to be what ideas influenced Charles Darwin, and what information and observations led to Charles Darwin establishing modern Darwinistic evolution as a scientific theory. Now, as I mentioned in the intro, Darwin wasn't the first person to grasp the concept of evolution. You can go far back, as far back as the ancient Greeks and philosophers such as Anaximander, Empedocles, and Lucretius, who expressed ideas about how the, the identity of species wasn't fixed, that species may change over time. However, this wasn't the predominant thinking for much of recorded history. Turn no further than Plato, for example, who talked about uh, what we call Plato's essentialism or Plato's forms. Plato believed that all living things had some type of perfect or essential form that was, was unchangeable and was infinite in terms of its time. And the way Plato talked about this, he kind of viewed our reality somewhat similar to an ancient Greek version of the Matrix, where basically there was no way anything could achieve its perfect form on Earth. But it's these forms, these unchanging essences, hence the term essentialism, these essences of living things that led them to be readily recognizable to us. And what we perceived on Earth was actually subtle changes in this form, and we were never able to actually observe the perfect form of these species. So let's use a rabbit as an example. If you look at it through the lens of Plato's essentialism, we can look at a species and go, that's some type of rabbit. And the reason why is there are hints of this these, these essential or these essences that, that belong in all rabbits. But there was no way that we could ever observe this essential or perfect rabbit on the planet Earth because that's not how reality works. So in Plato's eyes, somewhere there was this perfect, most hippity hoppity, rabbitiest rabbit that's ever rabbited, but that it could never be observable on Earth. And that the differences that we see amongst rabbits were just that. They were just simply an artifact of our existence. And I know this seems kind of weird, but again, remember that Plato was a philosopher at heart, and the way he was thinking about this was from a philosopher's perspective. But in a sense, we are all born as essentialists. We are all born trying to establish concrete ideas about the world around us. And, and that's actually necessary for our development. So we need to be able to grasp and look at something and say, that's a rabbit. We don't necessarily know what makes it a rabbit in our own head, but it's these ideas, these essential ideas that help us develop concrete ideas about the world around us. And as we get older, we begin to understand that not everything has this sort of perfect form. There are multiple kinds of rabbits and, you know, not all cubes are perfect cubes and not all circles are perfect circles, but we can recognize them for what they are. But the problem is, is because we all come up as essentialists, it does make it hard to grasp the concept of evolution at times. Because if you think about it, evolution is sort of the direct opposite of platonic essentialism. Because essentialism would hold that nothing changes. Everything remains static and everything remains unchanged over time. Whereas evolution teaches us the very opposite. It teaches us that species in particular change over time, albeit slowly in most cases. But if you want to use that example, Plato would tell you that if you went back into, into Plato's time, um, you know, about 2,500 years ago, you would look at a rabbit and it should look exactly like a rabbit that you see today. If you look at evolutionary theory, on the other hand, you would say, well, it may look similar to modern day rabbits, but it's not exactly the same. Enough time has passed where there, there have been subtle changes over time. So understanding that essentialist nature 
uh, of, of humans, as well as that particular thought process, you can begin to understand why for much of human history, it was very difficult to grasp the concept of evolution. Now, after the ancient Greeks, that sort of essentialist philosophy was sort of incorporated into the Judeo-Christian orthodoxy that ruled much of Europe and, and other parts of the world throughout the bulk of the modern era. And as a result, we were grasped with sort of a creationist philosophy where species were created. And again, they remained unchanged over time. It wasn't until we end up in the, the latter part of the, the Enlightenment, till we get into like the 16 and 1700s, that we begin to see individuals expressing evolutionary thought. We start to see scientists like Robert Hooke, who expressed ideas that species could go extinct over time, thus that not all species that have ever existed still continue to exist. This sort of dovetails nicely with the idea of evolution that species do change, and some of that change does necessitate certain species going extinct. We start to see individuals like Erasmus Darwin, Charles Darwin's own grandfather, who wrote uh, evolutionary ideas, talking about how species do in fact change over time, and that species could in theory change enough to actually become other species. The first major ideas about evolutionary theory actually come from Jean-Baptiste Lamarck. And Jean-Baptiste Lamarck uh, was the first person to give us an idea of what, what could be a potential mechanism by which evolution occurs. See, it wasn't uncommon by the time we get to Lamarck's time in the late 1700s, early 1800s, that we can grasp the fact that, spe that scientists grasp the fact that species do in fact change and that extinction exists. And one of the reasons why is people began finding fossils. Um, if you, the, the fossil were beginning to be discovered as a result of the Industrial Revolution and canal digging. And as more and more fossils were being discovered, people started to realize that these fossils didn't necessarily line up with modern day species. There was a whole dispute about that. We'll talk about that a little bit more when we talk about geology. But Lamarck proposed a concept of evolution whereby species change over time through something that we now refer to as acquired characteristics. Perhaps the best known example of this is the giraffe neck. According to Lamarckism, Lamarck would say that giraffes have changed over time to have longer necks. And the way this happens is that over time, giraffes stretch their necks farther and farther out to reach leaves higher and higher over the trees. And then in each subsequent generation, the neck is slightly longer than the last because of the stretching that has been done by the generation previous to it. There's a problem with Lamarckism, and the problem with Lamarckism is that we now know that acquired traits actually can't be passed on. The equivalent to this, for example, would be if two individuals who were bodybuilders and went to the gym every day then had children. According to Lamarckism, these children would be born with uh, enhanced strength just because of the acquired characteristics of their parents. Now, Lamarckism would go on to be disproven scientifically by a number of different studies. Perhaps the best known of this was done by the German geneticist August Weismann. Uh, Weismann actually studied uh, mice and he went through, and, uh, through six generations of mice, chopped off their tails and recorded the fact that no successive generations resulted in any shortening of the tails and so on and so forth. August Weismann is best known for his germplasm theory of inheritance. He basically stated that there was a barrier between the germ cells and the body cells. And essentially that the only information that could be passed on from one generation to the next was through the germ cells, which we now know as sperm and egg. And that that flow of information was unidirectional. That what the information within germ cells could go on to inform the somatic or body cells and could influence how they function, but that somatic and body cells could not then go on to influence future germ cells. We refer to this as the germline barrier. Now we know that this is, is, is relatively similar to what we understand about what, what happens. And in fact, we know that inheritance is strictly through those germ cells, through sperm and the egg, and that what happens in the somatic cells has very little, if anything, to do with what's inherited by subsequent generations. So while the fundamental concept, what we call the use and disuse theory in terms of Lamarckism and the inheritance of acquired characteristics has now been fundamentally disproven, we should give a nod to the fact that Lamarck was really the first biologist to go out there and actually give a proposed mechanism, a bold mechanism, for how evolution might occur. And we shouldn't just write off Lamarck as, as he was wrong. At least he made an attempt. And in science, science rewards the bold. He may have been wrong, but in, in understanding how he was wrong, we gained more insight into how, ev how evolution might occur. And the other thing we should note is that Lamarck's use and disuse theory that if things are used heavily, they tend to be strengthened and improved, and if things are disused or not used at all, they tend to weaken over time. That particular concept of Lamarckian evolution hasn't actually been dispensed with. 
And what we'll see with Darwinistic evolution is the use and disuse theory of inheritance isn't scrapped. Instead, it's retooled. It's given a new mechanism by which use and disuse actually occur. So let's talk about Charles Darwin. As I said, and most of you probably understand, Charles Darwin is the individual who gave us our modern understanding of evolutionary theory. So who was he? So Charles Darwin was an English naturalist. He was actually the son and grandson of surgeons, and it was largely thought that Charles would go on to be a surgeon just like his father and his father before that. But Charles Darwin was pretty rightly horrified by surgery in the early part of the 19th century. You have to understand there's no anesthetics, there are no antiseptics. It's basically butchery at that point, and he really wanted nothing to do with it. So instead, he wanted to be what was, re what was known at the time as a Parson naturalist. He ended up going to seminary and began observing the world uh, as a naturalist. He was particularly fascinated with flowers and beetles, not the band, but the actual insect. Uh, he was highly intrigued by them. Upon his graduation, uh, his advisor and later became friend J.S. Henslow actually got him uh, a pretty interesting job. He got him assigned as a naturalist that would be going on a ship known as the HMS Beagle. So the HMS Beagle was set to take a multi-year journey to go map the coast of South America for the British government. It was very common for naturalists to be part of this journey. Uh, they would help to report back on what types of flora and fauna could be found, perhaps providing clues about certain um, certain goods that could be imported or traded for uh, in, that in that region of the world. The naturalists, on the other hand, would also take that as an opportunity to begin studying particular projects or, or of their particular area of interest. So one of the things that's actually difficult to grasp about these journeys is how long they actually were. Think about it. Charles Darwin left England and was at sea for five years. Now, there's, a, there's really not much to do on these ships. There are no cell phones and there's no TV or anything. So what did you do? Well, you did scientific studies or you read. The captain of the HMS Beagle actually gave Charles Darwin a book that had recently come out by, written by a geologist named Charles Lyell. It was called The Principles of Geology. And this book was revolutionary at the time in that it sort of it, it altered the way we understood, or I should say it altered the way people at that time viewed the age of the earth. It was a modern concept of geology that really hadn't gained traction yet, but was just beginning to come to the forefront. And geology actually plays a big role in our understanding of evolutionary theory. So let's take a quick look about what geology, uh, what we knew about geology at that particular time, or at least what the field of geology looked like at that time. So geology became a very important topic sometime around the mid 18th century. And the major reason why was because of the industrial revolution. Now that place that, that people were beginning to produce goods through industrial processes, raw materials need to be shipped to those particular places where manufacturing was happening and then finished goods needed to, be removed, needed to be moved elsewhere. At this time in both Europe and then eventually in North America, one of the things that was happening to facilitate this since there were no trains or planes or automobiles was the advent of the canal systems. In, ser in large series of canals were being dug throughout much of industrialized Europe, including England. And one of the things that was happening as they dug these canals, they were digging down into the various rock layers and they were beginning to discover more and more fossils. Scientists who were particularly interested in these processes were looking at these, these rock layers and beginning to establish geological maps of their particular regions. And they were beginning to realize that these rock layers actually had some interesting properties and that there were similarities between rock layers on different continents. In England, William Smith, a geologist who became known as the father of, of geology within England, uh, was the first person to actually map the entire rock strata of a country. He began ordering rock layers. He began using some geologic concepts that had actually been written down about a century before by a Danish bishop named Nicholas Steno. He utilized four key concepts of geologic theory. The first concept is the concept of superposition. It basically, superposition is the, the easiest way to describe it is this. The newest rock layers lay on top of older rock layers. So if you look at a series of rock layers, the oldest ones would be on the bottom and the most recent ones would be on the top. The next principle is known as the principle of original horizontality. This is kind of a weird word. What it basically means is that rock layers particularly sedimentary rock layers, when they're laid down, they are laid down flat, that they are perfectly horizontal to each other. 
And then if you observe that they've been like tilted in some way or they've been, been pushed up or sunk down, that's the result of geologic activity after that rock layer was formed. So rock layers are initially flat, and then any uplifting or down tilting is the result of further geologic actions. The third principle is, the known, uh, is known as lateral continuity. And what it basically means is if you look at rock layers, as long as they look the same, you could assume that they were one united rock layer at, at, at a certain point. If you look at both sides of the Grand Canyon, you can see that the rock layers are identical on, on both sides of the Grand Canyon. Rather than stating that those rock layers were laid down separately and just happened to match, it makes way more sense in the geologic concept uh, uh, of uh, lateral continuity would state that those rock layers were all laid down as a single united rock layer and that the river that gradually eroded over time to now make them look like they are two separate edifices. So that's the concept of lateral continuity. The fourth key principle is known as cross-cutting relationships. So occasionally you can see rock layers and then another uh, two or three rock layers and then you'll see a fourth rock layer that cross cuts it, sort of intrudes upon it and runs through those other existing rock layers. Cross cutting relationship would state that that final rock layer, the one that does the cross cutting, that cuts through other rock layers, well that one must be by definition the most recent, the youngest. It must be younger than the other rock layers that it cuts across. And this just kind of makes sense, right? You can't cut through rock layers that don't exist. At the same time as William Smith is going around drawing geologic maps of England, you have James Hutton, who is really sort of the first modern geologist. He begins embracing the concept known as uniformitarianism. Based on calculating things like sedimentation rates and the rates of erosion of rock, James Hutton begins to grasp the concept that perhaps the Earth is significantly older than his, previous, that at the, that his contemporaries believed it to be. So at the time, it was widely held that the Earth was a few thousand years old, and that, that what the results of uh, what the reason why the Earth looks the way it does was because of a single catastrophic event that was basically celestially caused. That the reason why mountains exist and rivers exist and canyons exist and oceans exist and, and all of that all occurred at once and the earth has really never changed. But what James Hutton proposed was that that wasn't the case at all. By measuring set of sedimentation rates, by measuring erosion rates, James Hutton actually pegged the, the age of the earth in his book, The Theory of Earth, around 300 million years old. Now we know that the Earth is significantly older. It's more like 4.6 billion years old. But what we can see through the work of James Hutton is that we're, he's beginning to understand the concept of uniformitarianism. The idea that the Earth looks the way it does due to millions and now billions of years of gradual ch geologic forces that these powerful forces that shape the earth are continuing to shape the earth to this day, but that these processes are slow and that the earth is actually a very, very old planet whose age is measured in millions or billions of years. It's 4.6 billion years old. We know that now he didn't at the time, as opposed to a few thousand years. And that what we see on the earth wasn't the result of a single catastrophic event, but the result of uniformed events working over time. Things like earthquakes and volcanoes and, 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 and plate tectonics. This concept of uniformitarianism was really harnessed by Charles Lyell when he published his book in 1830, The Principles of Geology. And this is what Darwin was reading about on his journey on the HMS Beagle. He began to understand that perhaps the Earth was significantly older. And we'll see time and time again, Darwin is influenced by the works of others. And they begin to, he uses the information he gleans from these works to inform his own ideas about his particular area of interest in the world of biology. So uh, during, his voyage, during the voyage of the Beagle, Darwin makes several very important observations that are going to profoundly influence his understanding about species and how species may change over time. In short, what he's going to make are several important observations that are going to lead to his eventually proposing his own theory of evolution. One of the most important things he notices is the proximity of related species. As he journeyed throughout South America, he found that there were several closely related species that were very, very similar, but distinctly their own species. But that when he observed them, they were always like their own nearest neighbors. So for example, two species of Rhea, which are South America's version of the ostrich of flightless birds. 
Rhea panata and Rhea americana are two different species of Rhea that live in South America. However, one lives mainly in the highlands up in the mountains, whereas the other species lives mainly in the lowlands. And they both seem to have certain adaptations that make them better suited for either their highland or their lowland lowland environments, but you can clearly see that they are each other's nearest neighbor or nearest relative. What's particularly interesting then is that while there are there are Rhea pinata and Rhea americana in South America, they are distinctly different from other large flightless birds, such as the ostriches, and which the ostriches which inhabit Africa and, and formerly the Middle East, and even more distinctly different from emus, which inhabit the Australian continent. So again, he's seeing that while there are other flightless birds, the ones that are most closely related to each other are right next to each other. When he travels to the Galapagos Islands, he sees the same thing with Galapagos finches and Galapagos tortoises. He sees that there are, there are dozens of species of Galapagos finches, all of which appear to be very, very closely related, but are distinctly different from each other. They are clearly different species, but are so similar in the way they look, in the way they behave, that it's clear that they are, they are very similarly related. And what's interesting is while they're all very closely related, you can trace all of their ancestry back to a single species of finch that lives in South America. Another, the, the closest, the closest landmass to the Galapagos Islands. And it's the same case with the tortoises. Each island has its own species of tortoise that seems to be uniquely adapted to that particular island. From the shape of their shell to the length of their neck. You can see that they're all very, very similar to each other with a few exceptions that make them adapted for their environment, and they can trace their ancestry back to a species of tortoise on mainland South America. Again, the closest continental landmass to those islands. The same could also be said for extinct species. So, for example, while wandering through South America, Darwin was able to observe the fossils of Glyptodon. Now, Glyptodon is an armored mammal that is now extinct. What you need to think of the Glyptodon as, as a giant armadillo that's roughly the size of a Volkswagen Beetle that weighed several tons. Of course, it no longer exists. But where do you find Glyptodon fossils? Well, you find them in South America. Where do you find its modern-day relative? The armadillo, well, you find it in South and Central America and the desert southwest of North America. Again, you find the fossilized ancestor of something very similar to what lives in modern world right near it. The same thing could also be said of Megatherium. If you want to find a modern day sloth, you need to go to South America. Megatherium was actually a, was actually a uh, elephant-sized hairless ground sloth. That lived from about 5 million to about 10,000 years ago and inhabited the South American continent. Again, you find the fossilized ancestors of modern day species very close to where you find those modern species. And the same thing can be said for marsupials. Modern day marsupials live in South America and on the Australian continent. Where do you find the fossilized ancestors of those marsupials? Well, you find them in South America and Australia. And in fact, there are two different groups of marsupials. If you want to find marsupial species that closely resemble modern day Australian marsupials, you'll find them in Australia. If you want to find fossilized marsupials uh, that are similar to modern day South American marsupials, where do you find them? You find them in South America. So what Darwin began to understand is that Perhaps the reason that perhaps species do change over time. He also began to understand why they may change in the first place. One of the things that he observed was when you look at two closely related living species, there was always some type of barrier that existed between them. For example, let's go back to the Rias. One species of Rhea lives in the mountains. The other species lives in the plains. They are separated based on their altitude. If you look at the Galapagos species, well, they're separated by islands. What geologic barrier exists? Water. Tortoises don't readily cross water very well, so that serves as a pretty functional barrier. Finches can't fly very far, so a decent-sized ocean passage can make it a little bit harder for species to go back and forth. He began to realize that barriers to reproduction may actually play a role in, this, in speciation events. The other thing Darwin noticed on this journey was confirmation of what Charles Lyell had been talking about in Principles of Geology. He made several observations that made him believe and confirmed what Lyell was writing, that the Earth was actually very old. For example, high up in the Andes Mountains, he found large slabs of fossilized seashells. Seashells that didn't resemble anything that, looked, that lived in, in the modern world. In other words, the only way that those fossilized seashells could have gotten there is if somehow land from the ocean floor had been uplifted 
to become a mountain. At the same time, he would find the uh, he would find the fossilized remains of what are clearly terrestrial species lying next to modern day seashells, indicating that in some cases, things that were part of a terrestrial environment had now become part of the ocean. He even got to be he even got to experience an earthquake. And he saw the uplifting of land. But when he saw the uplifting of land, it only moved a few feet. The point is this. Darwin saw in these observations confirmation of what James Hutton and Charles Lyell had been writing about. Confirmation of uniformitarianism. That the earth does continue to change, but that that change occurs very slowly. And if the amount of change that we've seen, the mountain ranges, the highest peaks like the Himalayas and the Andes, in the, in, in the low places, places like uh, the Grand Canyon and in these big trenches that you see in the ocean, for those to form would require an extreme amount of time and that the earth might be very, very old. So why is this important? Well, this has always been the problem with evolutionary thought. It's clear to any observer that species don't change rapidly. They change very slowly if they're going to change at all. Well, if the Earth is only a few thousand years old, there just isn't enough time for species to change so much that they could diversify to produce other species or even really adapt to any environment at all. But by making these observations, what Charles Lyell gave to Charles Darwin, in a sense, is he gave him time. Time isn't a problem. If the Earth is, in fact, hundreds of millions of years old, there is time for species to change. There is time for species to adapt to their environment. There is time for species to slowly turn into other species. So Darwin continued his journey. The journey of the HMS Beagle lasted about five years. Upon returning to England, we probably like to think that he sat down and was like, I've got this great theory of evolution. I'm going to write a book and it's going to be amazing. He didn't. And there are a few reasons why. First off, when Darwin got back, he kind of just went back to work. He went back to his life and began studying things like beetles and orchids and, and things that interested him. It took him almost 20 years to publish on the origin of species. One of the main reasons why was because while Darwin had all of these evolutionary ideas, while he began to understand that species do change over time, he was still lacking the thing that Lamarck lacked. He lacked a mechanism. There was no reason why. There was no driving force behind why species would change. The thing that actually prompted him to write on the origin of species was actually because he was about to get scooped. Alfred Russell Wallace was referred to Darwin as someone who might have some ideas about evolutionary theory. Alfred Russell Wallace was making similar observations about the natural world, that species change, and that there's lots of time for species to change. Alfred Russell Wallace consulted with Charles Darwin, and it kind of also prompted Darwin to actually sit down and begin writing his book, which would be published in 1859. About the same, in fact, he published an article on the same date as, as Alfred Russell Wallace, so that neither one would actually steal the other one's idea, because they both agreed on the principles of evolutionary theory. Alfred Russell Wallace would also nod that Darwin had the idea a long time before him, he just hadn't published it. But what led to Darwin's understanding of of modern evolutionary theory. What led him to understand how descent with modification, as Darwin would term it, actually occurred? What was the mechanism? Well, Darwin began to think about what he had observed, how species may have changed, how barriers may have influenced this, how time could be a factor. But he was also influenced by what he read. So during the intervening years, Darwin, who was an avid reader, read two key books that influenced the way he thought about evolutionary theory. The first one was called An Essay on the Principle of Population. It was written by Thomas Malthus. And in this book, Malthus talks about how populations typically grow unchecked at a very rapid geometric rate as long as the food supply holds out. But every species on the planet is eventually met with something that he referred to as a Malthusian catastrophe. In other words, population grows and grows and grows very rapidly until the food supply is insufficient for that population and then people begin to starve and the population either levels out or drops. In this book, Thomas Malthus, who was an economist at heart, basically say that this was one of the major reasons for suffering 
and the human condition. Essentially, that we just populate too fast and then eventually we reach a starvation point and that's where starvation and disease and poverty come into play. The other book that profoundly influenced his thinking was called The Warring of Species by Augustine Primus de Candelay. In The Warring of Species, de Candelay goes on to talk about how all species seem to be at war with, both, with each other and within itself. That there are limited resources on the planet and that what keeps species population sizes in check is the competition for those limited resources both within a species and amongst other species that some species that all species are prey for something and a predator for something else darwin took the ideas in both of these books and synthesized them to form one general concept he began to understand how what he observed actually causes evolution to occur he began to grasp the fact that all species have the ability to overpopulate that they have the ability to produce more offspring than their environment can withstand he noticed that even within that within all species there is some amount of variation and he reasoned then that if some of these variations are beneficial to certain individuals that they might be better equipped to compete for those limited natural resources and that those individuals would then be able to pass those beneficial variations on to their offspring and if they're surviving in higher numbers then they are going to produce offspring in higher numbers and if they're producing offspring in higher numbers gradually over time that species is going to look more and more like those very successful members of the species and less and like less and less like the less successful members of their species as they begin to die out and lose into the competition whether they're eaten by predators or whether they fail to require enough resources to survive and reproduce and that's when the light bulb hit him the light bulb comes on and that's where you end up with the concept of natural selection natural selection Darwin rightly understood is the mechanism by which species change over time. Darwin in his writings referred to this, to these selection pressures, as we now call them as wedges, selection pressures, such as predation, starvation, disease. All of these function together to help shape species. And that no matter how subtle a variation may be within an individual, if it gives them even a slight edge in their ability to survive and to reproduce over time, the population will look more and more like those individuals with beneficial variations and less and less like those who have less advantageous variations. And that's where we end up with Darwinistic evolution. Descent with modification caused by natural selection. This is what Charles Darwin wrote about in On the Origin of Species, published in 1859, the revolutionary text that is the foundation for our modern understanding of evolutionary theory. Darwin was also very socially aware. He was socially aware of the consequences of his work and how it would be met. And to be clear, On the Origin of Species was met by both uh, exaltation by members of the scientific community and strong derision from other sections of the population. See, Darwin knew that his theory of natural selection was going to be controversial because it represented a form, a mechanism by which species could appear as they do, change over time, and become new species without the requirement for celestial intervention. There was no need in this theory for a creator to create species or to shape species. It simply occurred through natural mechanisms. And of course, that was going to be problematic, and the, the major opposition from the theory of evolution actually came from religious organizations, as it still does today for the most part. But scientists throughout the world had, had already begun to accept the core concepts of evolutionary theory. Because at the time, it wasn't just Darwin who was writing about it. It wasn't just Alfred Russell Wallace. What they welcomed was finally someone who identified the mechanism by which it occurred. Somebody had rightly identified the ways in which species do change and adapt over time. 
And what's very interesting is Darwin was socially aware enough to also recognize that evolutionary theory did apply to human beings, but that would probably be a step too far for most individuals at the time the book was written. He knew his book was already going to be controversial enough. And over time, he's, in, in the end of his book, he basically wrote that over time, light will be shed on the origins of man and left it at that. Some people have actually taken this to uh, to mean that Darwin didn't actually believe that humans evolved. Darwin was actually quite clear in, in other writings as well as, as other uh, presentations that he did believe humans evolved. In fact, he would rightly say that the earliest human ancestors would be found in Africa. Darwin ba believed based on our anatomical traits and similarities to other apes that we were in fact an ape species. So where would you expect to find the earliest humans? Well, where you find the earliest apes, and that is on the continent of Africa. People would largely ignore him for a few for about a hundred years and search in other places for early humans, finding only our most recent ancestors. But we now know if you want to find our most re our, our oldest ancestors, our earliest hominid ancestors, species like Cianthropus chidensis, you need to go to the to, you need to go to Africa in order to find them. There were also some negative consequences to the way people interpreted on the origin of species. Charles Darwin's own cousin, Francis Galton, actually utilized it to form the field of eugenics, which basically existed to try to prove that somehow that the, the societal differences that were observed were the result of Darwinistic evolution among humans, and that somehow, that somehow there were genetic differences that led certain segments of the human population to be inferior to others. That's a story for another day, but it had a number of sad consequences uh, on the human population, perhaps the most profound of which was what we observed in Nazi Germany in the 1930s and 1940s, the logical consequence of believing that certain people are genetically superior to others. Of course, this field of, of study is absolutely discredited and untrue, but this is also one of the dangers that Charles Darwin was afraid of when he published his theory of evolution in 1859. Today we talked about where Darwin's ideas about evolution came from. We talked about his trip on the HMS Beagle. We talked about evolutionary ideas that preceded Darwin's thoughts about evolution. Lamarckism, his own grandfather, Erasmus Darwin, as well as Greek philosophical ideas about how species may change over time. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you learned a lot today, and I'll talk to you real soon. Bye!